Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a variety of issues <laughs> uh, in protesting power in Nicaragua. Uh, Co-presence, justice, ah, I can also see it here. It's so good. Ah, no, I'm good, thank you. Um, Co-presence, justice, and memory. Um, and this story starts with the protests that started in 2018. But it also starts a bit before, as you guys know, I did field work in prison <laughs> uh, in Nicaragua uh, for over a period of, of seven years, which was both my master's research, I went to the same master's as Mina, <laughs> and uh, for my PhD research. And in 2018, I was finishing the write-up of the PhD. Any of you who do a PhD know that that's an, an exhilarating and a painful process at the same time. I didn't know that pain and pleasure could be so marvelously combined, um, especially when uh, right before I was to write my conclusions, uh, protests, massive protests erupted in, in Nicaragua against the government. Um, and at that time, it was as if this weird full circle was happening um, to my research. I had been looking at prisons in a country in Central America that is generally thought of as one of the more progressive, uh, with communitarian policing strategies, uh, with a, a supposed rehabilitative model inside prison, which while working with prisoners and former prisoners, I realized was not all as happy <laughs> um, as it was projected to be. But nobody else appeared to know that because it was what we call a public secret. What was going on inside prisons was not visible to the public. Um, I was granted access because at the time we, we were on good standing with the government and that already tells you something because that means that access is politicized and that the prison system and police system is thoroughly politicized already at the time. But I didn't really grasp the extent of that and the nefarious effects that could have until much later. Um, specifically when um, a number of my participants also started participating <laughs> um, in the protests in 2018. The motivations for the protests uh, were varied. The, the spark, let's say, that lit the, the pan on fire um, was uh, social security reform, austerity measures uh, taken by the uh, government, Ortega, uh, Daniel Ortega's government. Um, and when the elderly, who those social security reforms, let's say, most um, negatively affected, went to protest in the streets, they were met by uh, Sandinista youth groups who um, smacked them, <laughs> uh, smacked the elderly in the streets, and people did not like that. <laughs> um, and a lot of students specifically, and to say something, a lot of people live with their elderly in the same house, so there are a lot of extended households. So pension cuts affecting the elderly is something that definitely is something that comes closer to home than for us who you know, put our elderly away in homes or whatever. <laughs> Um, so the students took to protests as well, and those protests were met by even stronger repression. Um, and already on the second day of the protests, uh, there were deaths. And that meant that a line was crossed. And that meant that the protests got much larger. I would say that within the first four days of the protests, it grew from a few groups protesting in three cities to massive protests erupting across the country, rural communities, urban communities, students, uh, what we call autoconvocados, which are self-convened protesters. It was a, what they called um, some form of a, they called it the, the April uprising or an insurrection um, without arms, <laughs> we must add, um, that quickly turned into when the government decided not to um, engage in the protesters' demands and to clamp down harder, it quickly turned into a, a more, um, yeah, macabre kind of situation. The death toll over that f first weekend already rose to uh, well above 30. Uh, so you can imagine what that did for a country, a country that has a history of civil war. 
which ended in 1990. Um, at the time, I was, I think, just as many Nicaraguans, also because uh, I have a Nicaraguan family, and um, a lot of us, yeah, we were <laughs> very thoroughly taken aback by what was going on, uh, went into kind of this full-fledged um, uh, mobilization mode. Um, my social media turned into a protest feed. Um, anybody who has been working with protests and online uh, mobilization probably knows how quickly that can happen. Um, and I was also, I wasn't there, but my family was there and my friends were there. So I was constantly connected with them and I was, my first reaction was, I need to be there for them. I need to get this into the world. I need to mobilize the channels that I have to uh, get resources there, to get the word out. Um, and that um, meant that also quickly, I started uh, reaching out to other Nicaraguans in the Netherlands and started to um, organize uh, solidarity protests in the Netherlands. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of other people doing precisely the same thing in different countries in Europe. And very quickly, there was also this kind of transnational uh, solidarity support network that started to arise between the diaspora and uh, uh, solidarity uh, Europeans. Um, at the same time, the protests in uh, Nicaragua um, entrenched. Uh, there were uh, barricades, uh, university occupations, uh, roadblocks, uh, a lot of things going on. And at some point after the um, what they called the National Dialogue um, failed. Uh, one could say, use the word failed there because it was widely considered <laughs> a failure, um, was the start of Operation Cleanup. And Operation Cleanup meant that um, that started in May, uh, toward the end of May, meant that heavily armed riot police um, and regular police joined, uh, were joined by para-police groups or paramilitary groups, uh, partisan groups, of course, uh, uh, rallied or organized by the government, government supporters. Um, there was some coercion in this, some um, uh, uh, freedom also, of course, there are militant uh, pro-government supporters as well, um, who worked together to stamp out the barricades. And um, this meant that the death toll in that period elevated to above 300. Um, what, what the picture on the side you can see is uh, one of the uh, shot protesters being carried in his coffin through the barricades in uh, Masaya, a town outside of Managua. So, as all of this happened, um, as I said, during the, during when all of this was happening, <laughs> I was like, I, I, I can't deal. Um, this, you know, I, I couldn't be doing research on it and be in it as a very engaged person at the same time. I had no idea that I would later be doing research on it. Um, what I was doing, though, was clicking save on my Facebook feed so much. <laughs> I have a huge digital archive uh, at the moment. Um, to think about, okay, this at some point this is going to be important. And there were two things that I noticed, there were a lot of things I noticed, but there were two things I noticed that were particularly important during the protests. Uh, on the one hand, the use of smartphones and live streaming during uh, protests, which was uh, on the one hand meant to have people connected um, to the, the events going on, and at the other time was also meant to document what was going on. And those uh, live, Live streams were later also used and, and collected into a collective justice-seeking uh, project. At the same time, it allowed people, as I said, to be connected and to be co-present, to be simultaneously present with people on the ground. And that was very important for those of us who were outside of the country, but also important for those of us there. Um, because between the barricades, there was this complex system of communication in order to alert people if there were, for instance, riot police coming. A lot of the time at the barricades, uh, some of uh, my collaborators have taught me, was spent just sitting there and waiting to see when Operation Cleanup would hit my city, our city, the next city. Um, and it was very tense times, very tense days, um, and there was 
let's say, in terms of affect, this very uh, tense, um, when we were just whispering here, <laughs> uh, you would have these live streams with people whispering and saying, the riot police are coming. And, you know, with this very visible kind of um, uh, tremor in their voice or um, that you could really feel and be transported into that moment and uh, witness, uh, co-witness uh, what was going on. Now, later, um, so the protests were basically quashed and stamped out by the end of July 2018. But that didn't mean that the movement was over. Um, the biggest mobilization on the 31st of May involved about half a million people, and that's in a country of six million people. Um, so, the aftermath of the protests, during the protests and the repression especially, a lot of people started fleeing the country, a lot of people were detained, and the government um, continued, let's say, a more um, authoritarian style clampdown uh, post-protest. So once they had stomped them out, it was about maintaining the intimidation and the terror so that people would no longer um, mobilize outside. So there were very few actions outside, but there was a lot of organizing going on inside. I'm thinking now also of what Cristina was saying about these differences uh, between organization styles. Wow, <laughs> within the political culture in Nicaragua, there are so many differences. And these, the youth movements wanted radical horizontalism. The old school politicians, of course, were absolutely not used to that. Um, the Ortega himself is from a former, uh, yeah, uh, the Sandinistas, you probably know them, um, who inspired an insurrection, a, a revolution in 79. In their time, they had a radically vertical organization style, command, military command. And you were called a militante. <laughs> um, and they're still called militantes, so party members are called militantes. Um, and the youth, often children or grandchildren of revolutionaries, wanted a radically different type of politics. Um, but somehow they also had to deal with the political spectrum, the, let's say the minor political spectrum that was already kind of embedded in this kind of co-governance structure with Ortega. The business, uh, business elite, business class, um, and the older political parties, the liberal party, the more, let's say, conservative or right-wing parties, who all had this kind of uh, caudillo, this kind of um, veneration of one single leader and very horizontal, or sorry, vertical kind of styles. So organizing post-protest was very difficult. Um, not in the least because a lot of people were imprisoned. Uh, about 1,600 people were imprisoned, and among them, many of the uh, movement leaders, or if you could say in a horizontal movement, of course, leaders, but let's say people who had set up barricades, self-convened protesters, student leaders, peasant leaders, and that meant that, let's say, part of the movement was stagnated because they were imprisoned. Mid-2019, um, the government decided to do this massive um, excarceration to release, uh, they, they passed an amnesty law, uh, which was very controversial among the social movements themselves because it also exonerated culpability for all of the rest. So let's say the protesters were criminalized, they were said to be terrorists, to be coup mongers, and for that reason they had to be imprisoned. Um, there was this very, you know, very strong criminalizing uh, and judicializing discourse against them. And then, because there was so much pressure from outside and it, all of this stuff, they decided, the, Ortega decided to, I don't know if he particularly decided, uh, to let them go. Not all of them. He's always kept some people inside. Um, but that meant that these people who were now outside had to reintegrate into those movements, and that was a quite complex process. Now, as I had been working on prison, um, 
And as in particular, I had been working on the development of Nicaragua's hybrid carceral system. So how carcerality, incarceration, policing is managed by both state and non-state actors. Think about those para-police groups, <laughs> right? The ones that are up there above. Um, that was completely exteriorized to outside prison during the protests. Um, and that was also something that people had to contend with once they got out again. So having, being out of prison, but being basically confined to your home because there's a group of party militants constantly watching your house. And at the same time, there's a police patrol car periodically passing by, and they share information among one another. So what I started to do also because I had contacts on both ends of the line, let's say, so what we might call uh, sleepers or, or people who are still inside the party structure because they have uh, government jobs that they can't afford to lose. Um, those are people who are more inclined to help protesters um, and pass on information about things that are going on inside. And through that way, kind of finding out how the, those um, groups, that hybrid carcerality <laughs> is articulated and how many times they communicate and, you know, is it once a month or is it every week or and who is supposed to be there and who is the one that actually calls the shots and uh, finding out, for instance, that not the city mayor, but the party secretary for that city is the one that makes the political decisions. Now, I started where I was comfortable, which is a weird place of comfort, which is prison. Um, because unlike many of the protesters, I had been in prison before. Um, and things that they were surprised with, with the way that they were treated by the police, with the way that they were treated uh, by the penitentiary authorities, were things that I had been hearing about for years already. So when they got out and there was a time to share uh, testimonies, which were very painful and often involved acts of uh, torture, they began to try to find um, national and international idioms through which to express what they had gone through and through which to express their justice-seeking ideas. So they came, for instance, to the transitional justice um, framework, um, and they started adopting that to their own, um, to their own experiences and to think about what, what do we think about in terms of reparations? What do we think about in terms of justice? What is it to think about justice in a country where the ju judiciary is thoroughly politicized and you get sentenced to prison by a judge who believes that you are a quote unquote terrorist for raising a flag or raising or agitating against uh, a sitting supposedly democratically chosen government. So, that's what I'm currently working on, their ideas of justice and their ideas, how they memorize and memorialize the, the um, issues that they have gone through. At the same time, that meant um, uh, that meant that my knowledge of prison um, and my knowledge of the policing system, my knowledge of the hybrid carceral state could suddenly be used for other purposes. To help foot claims, to help uh, write denunciations before, for instance, the Human Rights Commissioners, uh, the Human Rights Commission on Torture, the UN uh, Commission on Torture, against torture. It also meant that um, through, let's say also because a lot of these people were leaving, fleeing the country, um, that I had an understanding of why and what were the particular risk factors to take into account. Um, uh, let's say an intimate knowledge of what was going on in Nicaragua and how that hybrid carceral state was articulated, what kind of structures were present, how the, how the orders went from top to bottom. Um, and that was interesting for 
migration agencies. I got to know a different kind of face of refugee and migration agencies, state refugee and migration agencies, because I had, of course, through my research long, um, and my contacts within the University of Amsterdam, long known people who had been mobilizing against, of course, the, um, the way that Europe deals with refugees, which I am completely um, in agreement with. But suddenly I realized how important it was that a migration agency gets information about a particular country. There was zero information on Nicaragua present with the migration agency in the Netherlands at the time that the protests erupted. They only had access to news and UN reports, for instance. So it was the first thing that we started to do was to set up a network where we could share a lot of other kinds of reports, like Amnesty International reports, and issues from inside. And that I, for instance, started um, uh, on the side of the uh, refugees' lawyers to do expert testimonies, which was a really uncomfortable edit, like, label for me. Suddenly, I was an expert on Nicaragua. Suddenly, I was invited to radio shows to talk about what was going on in Nicaragua. And suddenly, I found myself in this kind of expert position. So I had, all of a the sudden, these different positionalities. I was a researcher, so I had some critical distance. I was, always, I was also a family member of people who were participating, and a good friend of people who had been in prison, and at the same time, an expert, an activist, organizing demonstrations. <laughs> and these kind of, you know, the, with the, the idea also that experts are neutral, so to be a demonstration organizer and an expert at the same time. <laughs> it's kind of this weird um, connection. And I believe that if I would be an expert in the United States, I would, you know, they would uh, take my testimony as uh, not serious. Um, and I started to notice, because in this process, in September 2018, I got my doctoral degree, that having that doctor before my name also granted me that kind of um, privilege to move in different kinds of circles. Tomorrow, you're going to meet, if you're going to the theater workshop, uh, two of the people who were actually in the protests um, and who are also my research collaborators and my life partner. With them, during these demonstrations, we've also been organizing art or trying to keep doing what they used to do before the protests and trying to use, I think he would disagree if I use the word use, <laughs> try to work with theater to address some of the issues that uh, they went through, including um, imprisonment and um, state violence during the protests. We started working with other Nicaraguan refugees um, and created a collective which is called the Colectivo Subverso. The name was chosen. There was two name choices, Colectivo Subverso or Colectivo Dividido, the divided collective. I thought that one was very pertinent, especially because the opposition after um, after the crackdown had such trouble inter-articulating and though they had goals in common, how to get there was complete, in complete disagreement and continues to be in complete disagreement. But that also meant that I started to participate with these people. I also participated in some of these uh, performances um, to know how they were processing what they were going through, and how they were experiencing what they called exile. There was initially a refusal to use the word refugee, and they preferred the term exiliado, which is exiled or exile. And to see how they, were, how they continued to mobilize, and how they envisioned also these justice-seeking projects, what for them was justice what for them was continued participation, and over the course of time, what for them was also trauma and how to deal with trauma, because a lot of them at the first, you know, didn't really realize that that was going to be such a problem. 
um, and then were kind of stopped in their tracks when these traumas um, kept on coming back. And part of that process, I must say, is also um, the waiting process for the asylum. In the Netherlands, on average, it's two years, which is way above uh, what's legally permitted, but who cares about that in European migration? Um, and that process of waiting and adapting and being in this liminal position, being in between, not having a status, having suddenly a status that was a lot lower than the status that they had in their own countries. Um, some of them, for instance, even being uh, medical doctors who helped during the protests uh, to tend to wounded uh, people. Um, and having gone through very difficult um, situations as in that capacity to not being able to find a volunteer job, finding yourself kind of useless sitting around in a room in an asylum center, and turning also to the online sphere to continue um, your activism and uh, joining um, in diasporic activism groups. So I just want to leave it at that, so you have a taste of all the three themes, the co-presence, the justice, and the memory. This particular performance is in, uh, let's say, memorialization of the political prisoners who are symbolized through these uh, blue shirts. Um, they have to wear blue uh, in, in the judicial process. Um, and the Mothers of April, who are the organization um, of mothers of those who were shot during the protests. Um, and paying tribute, let's say, through flowers and lighting candles, um, and also through song, and there's particip participation also of poetry um, in these performances, um, to find an idiom through which to express also, and through which to memorialize uh, what has gone on especially, I would say, in the light of so much internal struggle um, and the, yeah, the lack of possibility to actually um, electorally, because it suddenly turned, let's say, to an electoral um, situation where, yeah, well, that's a different story, <laughs> but that was very unsatisfying for a lot of people. Um, to get into that dynamic, and they decided to do other things rather than to uh, suddenly you know, fall into a, the trap of electoral politics. So I'll leave it at that, and thank you for your attention. Um, okay.